Hello and hey, it's Zimmer Smell with Baldur's Gate 3. Today I'm going to overview four of the top builds that I've played in the last, gosh, where did the last almost two weeks go? Why four? Well, most lists are arbitrary anyway, and four is a party, so this isn't meant to be the best party, but it certainly wouldn't be a bad one either. Also, a bit of a note that these are the four best that I've played, not that these are necessarily the four best in the game, but they're all really, really good. And on top of that, they literally all have bugs benefiting them right now. They'll still be good when they get fixed, but right now, just outright broken. We'll start with the one I didn't foresee being quite as good as it actually is, Tavern Brawler Monk. Recently did a video on this one, we'll put that in the cards if you're interested. The Tavern Brawler feat might be the single biggest stat boost any archetype has access to. I wanted a big body out there just throwing hands, and with the way of the open hand we get that in spades. The insane plus 5 to hit, plus 5 to damage of unarmed strikes or thrown weapon attacks at 20 strength is incredible. And for an archetype that has to overcome weapon enchantment, the plus 1s, 2s, and 3s of the world, this lets them compete no problem. At level 8, we already are in the full swing of things, have 20 strength, plus 13 to hit, guaranteed 15 damage every time we land a blow, hitting 4 times around, getting targets prone, pushing, stunning, catching projectiles that are fired at us. Then we add the 3 levels of rogue, specifically thief, extra bonus attack for flurry of blows, unarmed strikes, or mobility in the form of jump and step of the wind. Not many melee characters have the ability to keep up with a monk that wants to dance around the battlefield. The AC becomes a bit of a weakness at this point, but not exactly a character you want to stand your ground against. We're definitely going to get our hits in too. Which is where the final level comes in, unironically respect to be the first level, Fighter. We get all the armor proficiencies, defense fighting style, and second win for when you're really in a pinch. If we want to stand and deliver, it takes an absolute monster to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with us, generally taking more than one. Hasting one of these monks during their wholeness of body rounds can result in 10 attacks and over 200 single target damage in one turn, ready to do it all over again the very next round. The bug affecting them that is positive is, if you are holding a finesse weapon in your main hand, you could flurry of blows and have your unarmed strike trigger sneak attack. What's more, if you have it set to not ask you to use it and you fit the conditions of sneak attack, it will give you sneak attack on both hits of flurry of blows. This isn't crazy, but it is 4d6 extra piercing damage, an average of 14 piercing added to your totals. But it's also not going to make you sad if and when it gets patched out. So for now, you can walk around with a finesse weapon in your main hand, get the sneak attack, take the weapon off at no cost, and continue to unarmed strike with your next actions though it is an action to re-equip, so if you want to keep using that, you probably want to just keep that on. It's just an interesting interaction, and I want to thank Beanbag for getting me to figure out what the conditions were for triggering sneak attack for Monk, as punching twice for piercing damage isn't what should be expected. Next up is straight up the heaviest hitting damage dealer in the game. Tempest Domain Cleric Multiclassed with Sorcerer. I also think Cleric and Sorcerer combined to form possibly one of the best support characters in the game too. That one is both more subjective and has some really, really strong competitors. But I can't recommend Light Domain Cleric 6, Sorcerer 5, Paladin 1 enough. Just a Cleric duct taped to a Sorcerer with Paladin heals is so, so good. Anyhow, the damage variant is the one we're interested in most here. And I will link to the cards once I get a video up about it, should be in the next couple of days. You might be aware that Tempest Domain's Channel Divinity can maximize the damage roll of lightning or thunder damage. Combining this with throwing water on enemies beforehand will result in sickening lightning damage numbers. The easy to point to example is Chain Lightning, which we would need to scroll for without grabbing a level of wizard, which I won't even leverage myself, but assuming you could get four enemies close enough, wet, and all fail their saves, with 22 charisma and the lightning draconic sorcerer as your subclass, you would do. 688 total damage for one action, plus any damage survivors took from being blasted over electrocuted water. It's pretty decent. The weak part of that is, the single target is only 172, plus the electrocuted water. There is actually a decent section of enemies that could shrug that off and keep coming, and we have the answer for that. Enter Chromatic Orb, or even better, Witch Bolt. If you twin either of those, you are reliant on an attack roll, but also means they have the possibility to crit. Meaning Chromatic Orb can max out with 236 to potentially two separate enemies, though more likely only 124 from a non-crit. And Witch Bolt can skyrocket all the way to 300 or a measly 156 on a non-crit. There is an Elithid power that can turn a normal hit into a crit, guaranteeing that if we would hit, we do the outrageous numbers. And I so wish that the Killer's Sweetheart Rings Executioner effect worked for spell attacks, because then you could reliably walk up to a group and do 600 damage in a turn. However, it doesn't, so you'd have to rely on sleep or hold person, any form of true incapacitation for the guaranteed crit. All that without mentioning that the Sorcerer can cast a high-level Call Lightning and just spam that for the rest of the combat, provided they can keep concentration on it. The bug that benefits this combo is likely one of the easiest fix and is legitimately game-breaking. 
To twin these six level spells, it should cost six sorcery points. If you click the spells in the correct way, however, it costs zero. Though you do have to have the number of sorcery points it's supposed to cast. If you click the spell, then click the upcast level, then click twin spelled, and then select your targets, it will use zero sorcery points. You burn the six level spell slot and the channel divinity, but you don't have to re-up on sorcery points with your bonus actions. You can keep twinning spells at the cost of only the spell slot it takes to cast at one target. That's what I'm talking about. Legitimately broken. That's not staying how it is. Regardless, popping a huge single target 300 and then merely resorting to multiple AoE call lightning casts for a total of only two spell slots is enough to keep pace on damage with some of the best characters in the game, even after the big burst. Remembering that they get two channel divinities per short rest if you go to Cleric 6. Absolute annihilators, pure and simple. I would be completely remiss to not list Paladin multiclass with almost anything. When Larian released player stats, there was what looked like a gap of 40,000 or more between Paladin, the most popular choice, and Sorcerer, the clear number two. A fair number of people, including me, multiclassed those and the third choice of Warlock together, and while that didn't stick around in my game, it wasn't the Paladin's fault whatsoever, and I ended up with an immovable object of a support character by sticking it out to Paladin 12. But that's misdirection again. The mix I'm talking about is Warlock 5, Paladin 5, Fighter 2. And there's one word. Smite. The top end damage for Paladin is just the highest melee potential in the game, and it's not really that close. There isn't much more to add here. Just make a bunch of attacks, smite all of them if you want, especially the crits, and then stand back and look at the mess you made. It's so popular that you probably already have at least one in your party, so I don't need to sing its praises, Paladins that is. The bug is one of the most documented in BG3 as well, being that the extra attack from Pact of the Blade stacks with the extra attack from other classes, even while explicitly saying that it should not. Another reminder to never take the game's word at face value, test everything yourself. And the last build, similar to Sorcerer Cleric, where you could go a couple different ways and still have it perform wonderfully, Dual Crossbow Rogue. The ever-popular Gloomstalker Assassin Fighter isn't quite as good as advertised as we only get a single Dread Ambusher attack, not the three many of us were expecting from a hasted action-surging combatant. However, the theoretical damage was so high, who cares? And in practice, yeah, who cares? If you are getting a surprise round on your enemies, it delivers as advertised, easily pumping out 250 damage opening rounds, even if you miss, and way higher with min-max turns, consumables, etc. Just like I said in my Rogue video pre-launch, there's a link in the cards, assassins can be bait if you aren't getting your surprise rounds by either playing with a group that wanders aimlessly into fights or not knowing what an encounter is going to sneak up on you. This multiclass lives for the first round of combat, so if it is CC'd or unable to participate for whatever reason, it does weaken considerably. Still a good 12th level class, but it wouldn't make this list. Just like the other option in the same vein of Fighter 8, Rogue 4, don't have that first round explosion, but four attacks every round to the end of time, getting 60 to 65 damage even if permanently missing one of those attacks per round. It's consistent damage coming from your sneak and lockpicking expert, maneuvers can give some great utility in fights, and that action surge will produce a 150 damage round from time to time. I chose it to be more consistent and it absolutely has been. Simple to play too, quick turns, keeps everything moving. The bug that benefits this build, and it, it really benefits hard, is that the offhand crossbow is not affected by the minus 5 penalty that the sharpshooter feat is supposed to impose. Meaning, your offhand shots will just do plus 10 damage. With Thief's two bonus actions, they are incredibly accurate, high-powered artillery shots, giving that consistency and you will feel it if that goes away. Just think of Rogue adds so much with how many locked things are in this game. Others can do it too, but this combo is so simple and strong, it's an easy recommendation. And I'll give a little bonus section to those that have made it this far, to the ones I thought were going to be good or just missed out on making the list. First up, Druid Barbarian. I love the idea of just a livid bear tearing it up out there. Unfortunately, the character's functionality in Wild Shape is even less than what you can do in Tabletop, so while you can rage and then go Wild Shape to still get that thing, it's not quite the same. And then you don't have the flexibility of using spells before Wild Shaping and then continuing to use them when you aren't raging either. Druids have great mobility and incredible wild shapes. They are good. They just end up being a little bit bland mechanically, though, so I think a lot of people could be a bit bored if they aren't dead set on the roleplay of it all. It just ended up a little worse than I expected, so I couldn't put it on the list. Next, and I made a relevant video about this too, summoners. They are very good, keeping up on action economy over your enemies, with the highest level summons being hard-hitting units of vast hit points in armor class. There aren't any real specialized versions of builds, however. Druid works, Cleric works, Wizard works. 
It's slightly good and definitely good enough for those dead set on the playstyle, but not a full no qualifier recommendation because the summons don't require concentration. You can have them all. It quickly becomes, how do I get them all? Multi-class where? Not which ones work best. It's a blast to have a zoo, but think a restriction of some kind actually would have benefited this archetype. And lastly, one I'm kind of disappointed in, even though it is also good, Sorlock. I know people are having fun with this, but between the, I guess, bug of not being able to choose which spell slots you're using if you have the same level Warlock spell slots, or having Warlock spells require higher level slots than you have of Warlock slots, so it was clunky and frustrating and didn't quite work. A really good example of if it gets fixed, it'll move up a great chunk. Just wanted to mention it because the further I get from that character, the more disappointed I end up being about it. And I don't know why, because it's still good. Anywho, I'm venturing on rambling territory. So that was about four multi-class combos that I found to be a cut above the rest of what I've tried. I'd love to hear about what you've been wreaking havoc with across Faerun, but I hope to catch you in the next one. As always, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Be safe, guys.